Hello. Good evening and welcome to our 2021 undergraduate admissions virtual open day. And welcome to the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. My name is Vanel Gregorio, Director of the Marketing and Communications Office at the St. Augustine campus. And I will perform the duty of host this evening to take you through our proceedings. Before I begin, I would like to say a very special thank you to everyone who is joining us on the live stream this evening. I know we have with us parents, guardians, siblings, teachers, and of course, our future students. Thank you all for taking the time to spend with us this evening and for giving us the opportunity to share more about this great West Indian tradition called Yui. As you may know, the Yui family is spread out across the Caribbean. And at this time, when some of our regional family are facing such trying times, we really hope that you and your loved ones remain safe wherever you may be. Please feel free to share with us your questions and your comments in the live chat on the Facebook stream, and we will address as many as we can during the Q&A segment, which comes up a little later on in the program. Our agenda for this evening will flow as follows. We will have opening remarks from our campus principal, Professor Brian Copeland, we will then move to an overview of the admissions process, which will include a brief look at the entry requirements and the online application process. We will hear from the Division of Student Services and Development, those who are responsible for support services for students and those who oversee scholarships, bursaries, career and co-curricular programs. We will also address the financing of an academic program and the options that are available to you. After this information, we will open the floor to answer your questions. So you can type them in the Facebook chat and we will share them with members of the team who are here with us this evening. <clears throat> Joining us on the call, we have members of the executive management team. We have deputy deans and representatives from our eight faculties, senior members of our registry team, managers of the division of student services and development, financial managers from the bursary and other staff. To start this evening's program, I invite Pro Vice Chancellor and Campus Principal, Professor Brian Copeland, who sits at the helm of the St. Augustine campus. He will address you now. Principal? Thank you, Winnell. And thank you to our virtual audience for tuning in to our virtual open day for undergraduates. The first in a series of information sharing sessions. I'm always so very happy to interact with our prospective students. Like most people, I prefer face-to-face, -face, but unfortunately the global pandemic has made virtual interaction an absolute necessity that will certainly impact on how we conduct this aspect of our business past pandemic. Now where 2020 might have been viewed as an anomaly, 2021 is telling us flat out that we are in for a long haul in what is essentially World War III. There are advantages, however. With virtual sessions such as this, we can reach a lot more people. Greater interaction via the chat option and the comments is possible. And if we could not be there at the time and date, we simply can go onto Facebook or YouTube and review. Now, that being said, it is evident that we remain in crisis mode. Trinidad and Tobago is into a second year of closed borders and public health safety protocols. There will be no room to relax until practically all our population is vaccinated. Now, even as we gradually move to what we call a bricks and clicks model of teaching, the University of the West Indies will continue as it has always done. That is to advise, to educate, to innovate and to teach. Here at the St. Augustine campus, we provide a place of education, learning and research of a standard required and expected of a university of the highest standard. I'm quoting here colleagues from the UE Charter of 1972, our founding document. This clause has always been at the heart of UE, starting with the Royal Charter of its predecessor, the University College of the West Indies, which was a college of the University of London back in 1948 and the subsequent charter that formed the current UE in 1962. Lots of history here. We are holding this open day session 
to invite you to join us in our ongoing quest of providing the Caribbean region with well-qualified citizens, strong enablers for its growth and development. Now much has been said of the UE global reputation in the past year or so. You would know by now that the world's most reputable ranking agency, that is the Times Higher Education, has ranked the UE among the top 600 universities in the world for 2019 and 2020, and the 40 best universities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this was in 2018 and 2019. We're now in the top 20. As important as these figures are, as important as these figures from these ranking agencies are, I never needed, I'm speaking here personally, I never needed an international agency to tell me how great a university the UE is. As someone who graduated with a BSc in electrical engineering from UE in 1978, uh, that was a long time ago. Um, some people say half a century, it actually sounds longer that way. But I can attest to the fact that based on that experience, even then, my UE degree was recognized by many top universities internationally. So imagine my surprise when I was accepted at the U University of Toronto to do a Master of Applied Science in Electrical Engineering specializing in what we call the systems control. And then at the University of Southern California, where I read for a PhD in the same topic. My thesis supervisors at both universities were recognized global experts in the field working not just on concepts for solving the problems of the day, but also working as consultants on some high level projects, such as the Canada Arm of the Space Shuttle Program, which has now been mothballed, and for flight controls for the stealth fighters and bombers, this was at USC. My then supervisor was a consultant for Hughes Aerospace. I found my education at UE to be invaluable in navigating the very competitive and demanding academic environments at both universities. And indeed at Toronto in particular, I often got questions like, where did you do your undergraduate program? A couple of staff members there even recall the name of a student who preceded me, who had accomplished himself there. Someone who in fact taught me in my undergraduate years at UE. I admit that there were gaps in my education. However, I realized from my days at UE that a single program could never possibly provide all of the learning there is. And it is my responsibility to recognize those gaps and to address them through self-teaching. It has proven beyond doubt that your best, your best possible teacher is you. To me, this is the true value of a university degree. The UE that exists today has improved significantly since my days as an undergraduate. It has produced many leaders including prime ministers and leaders of industry and well-qualified professionals that work to build and grow society over the past 40 years. At the young age of just 73, uh, and that's young for universities, we have given this region more than 237,000 graduates, including 20 heads of government and a Nobel laureate. Among our numbers are discipline experts who will teach, guide, and inspire you and share some of the new knowledge that make them globally respected in their fields. I make mention here of academics such as Professor John Egard, who's, rec who's a recognized expert on climate change. Professor Patrick Hossein, who joined UE from Bell Laboratories, having amassed an un unbelievable number of patents in digital communications, well over 30 at last count. And Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, our Dean of, dean of Law, recognized globally as an expert in human rights, offshore finance, and labor law. And even now, our research efforts are being applied in the most obvious ways by those who will be your academic stewards should you choose to join us. For example, just as we in the Caribbean were beginning to cautiously emerge from the shadow of COVID-19, the university threw us, sorry, the universe threw us a curveball. But it was a curveball for which we had been prepared. Since December 2020, when activity on La Sofri volcano in St. Vincent was first detected, scientists from UE's Seismic Research Center here at the St. Augustine's campus were deployed to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our teams continue to monitor the seismic activity 
and their updates have been critical to the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines planning, activation of alert levels, evacuation, and other decision-making in the emergency management process. This support will continue as we deploy experts to assist in the areas of greatest need and mobilize expertise in the rehabilitation response. 2020 was the year that the St. Augustine campus rose up in unison for Trinidad and Tobago and the region and joined the fight against COVID-19. Key members of our Faculty of Medical Sciences and the Institute of Gender Studies are serving on the regional COVID-19 task force some of whom you would have seen on your television over the last year at the Ministry of Health's regular media meetings. Our engineers also swung into action, manufacturing key equipment and PPE, including new events, a ventilator system, and partnering with the public and private sectors to make things happen. The Molecular Biology Lab at the School of Veterinary Medicine and the PCR machines at the, at the Department of Life Sciences here at St. Augustine were made available to the Ministry of Health. Our 100 nursing students were recruited by the Ministry of Health to conduct contact, contract, trace, contact tracing, while our Center for uh, Language Learning trained Cuban COVID-19 response nurses in English for medical purposes. Four UA experts were later appointed to Trinidad and Tobago's National COVID-19 Recovery Task Force. UE Chancellor, Mr. Robert Bermudez, Professor of Practice, Mr. Jerry Brooks, who's co-chair, Professor of Practice, Mr. Winston Dukaran, and Professor Emeritus, Director of the Center for Health Economics, Professor Carl Theodore. Beyond that, there are the devast devastating effects on our economy, which was already sliding prior to the pandemic, as well as our mental health as we struggle to cope with what it is. This, as we'll explain shortly, is where you come in. Now, like other universities, the UE has grown in complexity and has expanded in scope. Our latest growth poll is in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship, in which we seek to nurture and grow new ideas to create impact on society. Through now how products and processes, possibly as inter alia, nuclei for new startup and spin-off companies, significant social and legal policies, techniques for preserving or restoring the ecology, and innovative medical procedures. We want you to be a part of this new and exciting new venture, one that many agree is critical to the revitalization of the Caribbean and the survival of its people. Indeed, at the St. Augustine campus, we have in the last couple of years created two startup and spin-off companies. We have two more in queue, sold two technology licenses and are currently processing three patents from students and staff. Our vision is that through this bold step, we can well see that in a decade or so, the Caribbean economic landscape will be dominated by a swarm of foreign exchange earning enterprises that are led by you and your colleagues. In fact, I challenge you to be the game changers to make this dream a reality. So as I said before now, this is where you come in. We see you as game changers in a world post COVID-19. Game changers who will begin the process of rebuilding the Caribbean economies, societies, and ecologies, targeting a sustainably developed existence. It will not be an easy task. It will require skills and attributes that go beyond pure academics. You require resilience to face the difficult, difficult tasks of resuscitating our economies. You will need moral fiber to stand up for the disadvantaged, victims of the, of the inequities that have been more openly exposed by the pandemic and also to confront the corrupt. At UB, we will challenge you to become this robust model Caribbean citizen by establishing programs that target the embedding of the ideal characteristics of our graduates. So permit me just to list them very quickly. We expect that you will be a critical and creative thinker, an effective communicator with good interpersonal skills, IT skilled and information literate, innovative and entrepreneurial, globally aware and well-grounded in your regional identity, socially, culturally, and environmentally responsible, guided by strong ethical values. And of course, we expect you 
to have demonstrated competence in the academic discipline of choice. Now we have no power over what the future will bring. It is however within our power to prepare ourselves and our communities to be self-reliant. As a student of this regional university, you become part of a select group connected by water and technology and sharing a bond across five campuses within a single university, very unique. We are UWE, the main unifying force of this one Caribbean. During these unprecedented times, it is an imperative then to equip yourself with high quality knowledge and skills. You will at some time also need to retool as the world and technology with it are changing at warp speed. You will get all this and more at the St. Augustine campus, all the while participating in knowledge discovery and application, even as you work towards your degree. I again urge you to join the next cohort of game changers on this campus. Browse our website for the hundreds of undergraduate and postgraduate programs that we offer, or use our new BUE app to find the right program for you based on your CAPE, Cape and CSEC passes. Uncover your excellence and develop your innovative and entrepreneurial abilities. At a time when the need for the voices of the Caribbean has never been greater, be the one to take action and begin the process of applying knowledge, old and new, to world problems. I would like to thank you. I wish you all the best this afternoon. Well, Thank you, Principal. Thank you for sharing your first-hand information, your story, and, and thank you for setting the stage for what's to come for the rest of our program. I noticed you were quite modest in not um, listing yourself as uh, one of the one of the many uh, leaders that we have at the campus, but anyone can Google and see the, um, the extent of the work that you've done, the research and, and the accolades that you have received. Yes, my um, life is a simple book right now. <laughs> yes, it is, it is. A simple Google will show, Google search. Thank you for that again, Principal. And uh, I'm happy to, to turn our attention now to introduce Ms. Simone Roberts, who is our Assistant Registrar for Recruitment, Admissions and Enrollment and Student Affairs. And she will be telling us more about the admissions process. So to our viewers, we, we urge you to take out your notebooks, take out your, your mobile device or your iPads. And, and if you hear anything that you would like to know more about, jot it down and feel free to share your questions in the chat with us later. Uh, Simone, I turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you, Winnell. Good evening and welcome again, everyone to our undergraduate virtual open day and thank you for joining us this evening. I will provide you all with an overview of the undergraduate admissions process. And um, let me start by sharing my screen. Oops. So as I said, I will provide you all with an overview of the undergraduate admissions process. But even before we begin, um, before you begin the process, you should have an idea of um, what program or programs you wish to um, pursue or apply for at our campus. At St. Augustine campus, we have over 100 undergraduate programs um, from which you can choose. These programs include degrees, diplomas, certificates, and these are offered by our eight faculties, which are listed there, science and technology, food and agriculture, humanities and education, engineering, law, medical sciences, social sciences, and the Academy of Sport, which belongs to the Faculty of Sports. To help you choose a program, the campus has developed uh, an app, the BUE app, which the principal just referred to. And this has actually been developed by students of our campus, by our own students. And this is available on, our, on the page as there, the programs page of our website. The link is available on that page. And if you plug in your 
qualifications, CSEC, CAPE, or equivalent academic qualifications, it will match you to related programs, which will assist you in choosing or making a decision on which what you wish to apply for. The university has some basic matriculation requirements, which all applicants require. And this is the passes in at least five subjects at CXC, GC, BG, CSC, or equivalent, and must include English language and maths. Higher level matriculation requirements include GC levels, CAPE, a first degree, an associate degree, a diploma, a certificate from tertiary in, from other in, tertiary level institutions. But I would not, but I would not, I would also encourage you to still apply even if you do not have any of these qualifications that we have listed here, because you will, your application will be considered. Yeah, so don't be discouraged if you do not have uh, um, an academic qualification that is not listed here. As a result of COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the university decided in 2020, 2021, which was last year, to revise the matriculation requirement as it relates to CAPE. And this um, revision has been extended to this year, this intake, the 2021-2022 intake. Specifically, the revision is a waiver of the CAPE Unit 2 requirement, which says that the waiver will allow applicants who have the requisite CSEC subjects to qualify for normal matriculation to UWI, provided that they won, have passed at grades one to four, a minimum of two CAPE subjects, either at unit one or two, and two are currently registered for either CAPE unit one or two. Bear in mind that some faculties have spe some specific conditions that will apply, yes? So we have the revised matriculation requirement introduced last year continues into the 21-22 intake. I now take you through the steps of the undergraduate application process. The application portal is open, currently open for applications for the 21-22 academic year, and the portal will close on July 31st, 2021. The first step that is required if you wish to apply for a program at the St. Augustine campus, is to complete and submit an online application form. This form is completed and submitted by the online application portal. So there's no reason for you to come into the campus, to come onto the campus. You access the form via the website. The link is there, admissions slash undergrad, and you complete the form you can select up to four program choices. So you have a first choice, second choice, third choice. If you're not successful for your first, then you would be considered for your second, third, fourth, as the case might be. So as the first step, you need to submit an online application via the online application portal. The second step requires that the applicant submits the required supporting documents. So these documents are uploaded via the eCourier Secure File Transfer Facility. Again, just as you are not required to come into the campus to submit uh, the form, you are also not required to come onto the campus to submit your supporting documents. You can use, not you can use, you need to use the eCourier Secure File Transfer Facility, which will allow you to upload all your supporting documents. Some important points for you to note regarding the submission of your supporting documents. As I said, um, these documents must be uploaded and you will find the upload document link within the application page, the online application page. All your documents must be certified 
except for the undergraduate confirmation and the payment receipts, but all other documents must be certified. Transcripts must be forwarded directly to the admissions office by the awarding institutions. So the admissions office will not accept transcripts that are submitted by the students or student copies of a transcript, yes? If you have submitted three of your supporting documents previously and you wish to submit two more following um, several days after, you can do so. There is no um, nothing stopping you from doing it. If you go to the web to the site listed there, and you will be allowed to submit your additional documents again using the eCourier facility. Step three, at any time, once you have submitted your application and your supporting documents, you can track your application, the status of your application. In fact, we encourage you as an applicant to track the status of your application because you will be provided with information. For example, if a document or documents are outstanding, this is where you would be advised by the admissions office that these um, documents uh, still need to be submitted. Also, very importantly, you would see here when you track when and if a decision has been made on your application, which is what we are all very anxious about. When am I going to get a decision on my application? But if you keep tracking, you will see when a decision has been made. Following the submission of the online form and your documents, if you wish to change any information that you provided on the form, you can do so by sending an email to any one of the email addresses listed, ugapply at sta.uwi.edu or admis at sta.uwi.edu. Changes may include um, your, can, your CAPE candidate number, if you wish to change the order of your program choices, so your first you had first put accounting as number one, psychology as number two, and then in talking to somebody, they said, no, perhaps you should do psychology. So you, you simply need to send an email to one of these email addresses and your application will be updated with your request. Note the deadline for submission of these changes if you wish to request a change is July 31st, 2021. Or notification of acceptance. Once a decision is made, the applicant, you will receive an email from the admissions office advising of your acceptance. Please note that this email is not your acceptance or offer letter. Yes, because you would need to provide that acceptance offer letter to the gate office when you apply for gate. It's not the email that you would forward to the gate office. The email is just notifying you that you have been accepted and sending you forward to track your application where you would access the offer package, where you'll get the offer letter, your welcome letter, the acceptance, the offer reply form and links to all other things that you would need to know as a first year student, yes? Um, one thing I want to say to you all, you notice that um, throughout the steps in the application process, your login ID and PIN, these have been referred to several times. So these are two pieces of information that are very important and that you should remember throughout this application process because you certainly need your login PIN and ID too to track your application, yes? So you should remember these two pieces of information as you go along. If you have any questions after you have submitted your application or even before you have submitted the applications and you wish to contact the admissions office, you may do so via the telephone, um, the extensions listed, or again via admis at sta.uwi.edu or ugapply at sta.uwi.edu. We also have Mr. Nigel Bradshaw, who is our recruitment officer and who is always very willing 
to speak to applicants, to parents, to prospects. And if you wish to book a parent and prospect meeting, you may do so by emailing Nigel at the email address listed on the screen. Thank you very much for your attention and good evening. Thank you, Simone, for your very informative presentation. And for viewers, we will be repeating a lot of the information that was shared by Ms. Roberts this evening. I know we have some questions in the chat already, and a lot of them pertain to what she was sharing. We have people jumping on at different points in the program. So we will be repeating, as I said, the information. We will also be sharing it and sharing the email addresses and the links via the, what, the Facebook chat. So now we turn you over to another one of our departments. We, we have the Division of Student Services and Development and our colleagues in the division are those that support with uh, career guidance, psychological support, you name it, and they are there for our students. And so we ask you to now turn your attention to Ms. Kathy Ann Lewis, who is the Manager of Careers, Co-Curricula and Community Engagement. And Ms. Christy Smith will follow her and she will be talking about financial advisory services. Colleagues, over to you to share more with our prospects. Thank you, Winnell. And welcome to our students to this open, virtual open day session. And as Winnell said, my name is Kathy Ann Lewis and I will be speaking today about all the support that we can provide you at the UE, all the support you will receive and all the support you need to succeed in the university environment and beyond. In my position at the university and for all the division, the departments that will support under the Division of Student Services and Development, you can expect support for your learning, support for student development, and support for your overall success. The division functions as a strategic partner in student learning and development. At the division, as at the university, we focus on your holistic development, your academic, personal, and professional success is paramount to what we do. The division works hand in hand with the faculties and the other university departments to ensure that you're fully integrated and that you receive holistic educational experiences and support while you are with us. To ensure this holistic support and integration, eight departments under the... Thank you. Sorry about that. Under the division, eight departments with the, under the oversight of our director work together to offer access and accessibility, leadership experiences, emotional well-being and psychological support, a home away from home, cultural assimilation, student activities, career and personal development, and financial management. Once you are accepted to the university and you become a Pelican, the first year experience program is the UE St. Augustine's official new student orientation program. And this program targets all our incoming students, whether you're undergraduate, you're postgraduate, you're a mature student. We have specific interventions for you as you enter the university. 
This program is held annually and features a comprehensive suite of activities and events designed to support the successful transition of all our students to campus life. When you're thinking about emotional intelligence, your mental health awareness and inclusion, you are speaking about our CAPS department, Counseling and Psychological Service. And this department is committed to helping students maintain good mental health and awareness while they pursue their academic journey. We know that life happens at university and otherwise, and that adjusting to university life can sometimes be challenging. Well, whether you're faced with personal challenges, bereavement, health problems, homesickness, navigating relationships past and in the future, our free and confidential support services are available to all students of the UE St. Augustine campus. At CAPS, caring for the wellness of the whole student is their priority. At UE St. Augustine campus, we are in the business of developing tomorrow's leaders. And so under the division, we have the Guild Administrative Office that works in collaboration with our Guild of Students to support you in leadership, student voices, and student empowerment. We believe that you have a voice. We believe that that voice is important and we want to hear what you have to say. So we support your activism. We support empowerment through a number of student groups, associations and activities. And students, we want you when you get here and you become Pelicans to become engaged on campus. These two departments of which I speak, our student accommodation office and our student activities and facilities department, I present them together this afternoon, though they are separate departments. And this is because of our current global environment. But we at the university want you to know that once we observe proper preventative measures and that our COVID-19 numbers are reduced, we are ready to provide you with a home away from home and facilities for your recreational activities, global networking, regional friendships, and student communities. When you think about inclusivity and student success and student development, Think no more. At the UE St. Augustine campus, we support you in those areas as well. So if you need assistance with exam strategies, educational assessment, you need to bolster your time management skills. If you're an international and regional student, if you're a postgraduate or mature student, if you need exam accommodation, if you have special needs, look no further. The Student Life and Development Office provides assistance for you at the university. The Careers Co-Curriculum Community Engagement Department assists with your career exploration and development. We support your development of your personal and professional skills and we support engagement and volunteerism. Once you enter the university, and for some of you, it would be prior to that, because we do collaborate with a number of secondary schools to provide career assessments. But once you enter, we provide assessments to guide you in developing and navigating your career plan. We provide opportunities for our students to give back 
to our regional and international communities through volunteerism. We provide opportunities to help you become well-rounded citizens through enrollment in co-curricular credits. Students, we want you to know that for every year of enrollment at the university, the department provides targeted and specific interventions to help you on your career journey. We provide opportunities for internships, mentorship. We provide work experiences, skill development, job shadowing, informational interviews. We help you in your quest to perfect your resume, practice your interview skills, and get that all important job. And we do this through strategic partnerships with our local, regional, and global partners at our annual large scale recruitment fair with employers from all over the world. We also support our students in their financial services. And now I'll turn you over to Ms. Christy Smith, who's gonna to speak to you on the financial services which we have at the university. Thank you so much, Kathy Ann. Um, always a pleasure. And of course, I'm part of the team here at the Division of Student Services and Development. I just want to tell our students, our prospective students, and, and those who may be joining us who are already part of our Pelican Pride crew, um, a, a hearty welcome. And to say to you, of course, that we are here to facilitate your experience. We are here to ensure that your experience is one that you would take out and into the world as you become the next game changer. So to start, I want to just say hashtag choose action and here are some of the ways you can choose action. So high on the agenda, of course, and especially coming out of the COVID pandemic, are the socioeconomic challenges that our students and prospective students, families across Trinidad and Tobago, the region and the world are now facing. At the UWI, we are cognizant of those challenges. And so even well before those challenges, a number of facilities have been set in place to assist students uh, through financial options. And I'm here today, of course, to share with you the options available via the Division of Student Services and Development Financial Advisory Services Department. Christy, before you continue, I, I want to just ask you to make your presentation full screen, please. Sure, certainly. Yes? Great. Great. Okay, guys, so back to the, the, the presentation. Our department is charged with the responsibility to provide financial aid, assistance, and advice. It means that it's a threefold type of operation that seeks to not only provide monetary support, but financial aid in different ways. We, we work with a number of departments across the university to find resolutions to what may appear to be a financial challenge, but may turn out to be other challenges. Um, while I do say that our main charge is, of course, to provide financial support and through our scholarships and bursaries and our financial aid programs, we are able to do this. I want to touch a bit on our financial aid programs before we delve into the meat of the matter, the scholarships and bursaries. So at the St. Augustine campus, we have a few financial aid programs that we, we have enacted to support our students while they are here at the UWI. Uh, for example, we have our Adopt-A-Student program, 
Uh, this is a program that's funded by members of staff voluntarily through their salaries they give towards, and I'm happy to say that all levels of staff contribute towards this cause. This enables students to receive a stipend, a monthly stipend across a semester period for review at the end of the semester and into the new semester, um, semester two. Now, it, of course, I mean, not everyone that is applies will, will access it. Uh, you must meet the eligibility criteria. And the eligibility criteria uh, means that you have to present verifiable evidence to support your case. So if you are saying that you are in dire financial need, you send in your online application, we review the application, we interview you, and uh, of course, once your supporting documentation is in line with the, the claim that you're making, we would be more than happy to, to, um, to support you that way. Another financial aid program we have is our hardship grant program. And, and that allows you a one-time grant. Of course, it is based on financial need and uh, students again apply and the, uh, the application is assessed to determine the level of need and commensurate with the kind of aid that we can provide and finally, and most recently, um, the COVID aid support program for students who are impacted by the COVID pa pandemic. And this was, of course, donated, uh, funds donated by our Guild Executive of 2019-2020. So those are some of the aid programs that you may be able to tap into once you come on board with us so that we can help support you during your journey. I want to just go straight into our scholarships and bursaries because this, my, my dear students, is an opportunity for you to tap into financial resources that can assist you throughout your duration here at the UWI. But I want to first centralize the, the conversation here on some of the fast facts that, that are attractive about our scholarships and bursaries. First, of course, our scholarships and bursaries do have an academic component, so there is a GPA requirement. However, most of our donors have included a financial need component in their awards, so that a number of students who may be facing financial challenges, once they complete our forms, they're able to, um, to be assessed based on their financial need criteria. Some of the awards of also offer paid internships. For example, we have companies like Yara, um, companies like Keech and Nona, who give to, to, towards our scholarships and bursaries, and they do offer paid internships during the vacation period. All our scholarships are open to undergraduate students. And when I say all, I mean re regional, international, and local students can tap into this access to, to financial aid. And, but you must, of course, be full-time registered students and undergraduate students. And our, for our awards, you just have to submit one application form. And with that application form, you will be considered for the range of awards that are available once you meet the eligibility criteria. Now, to get more um, succinct, our awards, our scholarships and bursaries start at $5,000. $5,000 in this day, in this time, while we are in the midst of the pandemic, we have seen doing quite a lot for students. Um, it has allowed students to purchase laptops, much needed item now in the virtual space, allowed our students to, to purchase printers and all the other technical accessories required for uh, a proper UE education to, to ensue. Uh, students are also allowed to use these funds to support their personal situation. So, for example, they, some of our students in the face-to-face -face modality would have used it for transportation. Some used it to purchase meals, um, to purchase books. We have students using the, the funds to purchase equipment um, that's needed. For example, a med size student, a student doing the optometry, uh, they all now can access this fund. These funds through scholarships and to support their finance, support their equipment purchases. What do our donors look for? This is a question that many people ask. Um, so we have three basic criteria, academic merit, a GPA of 3.0. Sometimes our donors even go as low as 2.5. Financial need, 
of course, and involvement in extra and co-curricular activities. However, other donors, um, they, they have a range of criteria that really provides a, a more accessibility um, for students. For example, we have area specific um, scholarships for persons living in the Libre area, persons living in the Mayaro, Guayaguayari area, St. Andrews and St. Patrick's area. So we have specific donors donating um, funds that uh, include that type of criteria. So it gives students more access. Um, students as well are allowed to apply, especially if you're part of a past people's association, for example, St. Joseph Convent, Port of Spain, Holy Name Convent, Presentation College. If your parents are part of Teachers Credit Union, Teachers Credit Union is one of our donors who contribute, um, a long-standing donor who contribute towards these awards. So your application can come in. And of course, because you are part of those associations, you would be given priority in terms of the um, selection processes. And so these are just some of the, the broad range actually of criteria that our donors look for that really provides more access to our students seeking financial assistance. And just to say to you that this it is a simple three-step process. You visit our website, read through our guidelines thoroughly before you start, complete and submit supporting documents. One of our key supporting documentation is that financial need document. We urge students to fill out that because it allows us to assess your need and it opens up more access to you to bursaries and scholarships that have that financial need component. And the third and final step is upload the supporting documents and submit your online application uh, via our website. So it's quite simple, the three-step application process. And of course, we are on board here to continue supporting you. Our application period for you, our new students, uh, would run from the 1st of September to the 30th of September, 2021. And for more information, feel free to visit our website here. Uh, it's, it's listed here on the slide, sta.uwi.edu backslash scholarships and you will get all the information you require on our processes and application and eligibility criteria. So I just want to thank you, of course, we are here to support, um, we are here to channel your journey and we want to hear from you. Please feel free to contact us at financial.advisory at sta.uwi.edu and we have also included our contact information should you wish to call us. We really look forward to hearing from you and uh, welcoming you to the UWI in September. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues, Kathy and Christy. And viewers, we are staying on the financial track this evening. So to pick up where we left off uh, with finance and financing, I invite Ms. Carolyn Gooding, Senior Financial Manager, Students and Receivables, who will share some pertinent information with you this evening. Carolyn? Carolyn, you can uh, put it uh, at full screen, the presentation. We're seeing it well. So you can begin once you, you make it full screen. I think it's stuck with them. Okay, Carolyn, are you hearing us? Okay, I'm seeing that we have lost Carolyn. We have lost Carolyn for the moment. I think she may come back on with us and we will go to her when she's able to join us again. So let me give some information to our viewers. In the lead up to today's session, we started receiving some of your questions via our online portals. So before we get into the Q&A segment, 
let me share some general information on the topics that were raised. Access to the campus. At this time, access to the physical campus is still restricted in keeping with the COVID-19 guidelines nationally. And some of our students have been allowed access in order to complete certain components of their programs, labs and practicals. However, to the general student population, access to the campus is still restricted. To our prospective students, there is no need, as Ms. Roberts said earlier, for you to come on campus physically to complete your applications. All the resources that you will need to complete the applications are available online, and we will get to that a bit later. We'll reiterate in the chat, etc. In terms of delivery of classes, until we are guided otherwise by our government, classes will continue to be conducted virtually. But as we mentioned, uh, special permissions have been granted in cases where students have to get access to the campus. In terms of our program offerings, you've asked about that and a full list of programs that are offered by our eight faculties can be found in our respective faculty booklets. All of these can be accessed online and our chat moderators, I'm asking them to put all of the links in the chat uh, so you can access it. And many speakers, the principal, Ms. Roberts, they all spoke about the BUE app. It is brand new. We are so excited to share it uh, because it was specifically developed for you by our own students at the Department of Computing and Information Technology. And all you would need to do is plug in your CSEC and your CAPE subjects, and you'll be able to discover the wide range of programs you can consider, and some of them that you may not have even thought of before. So we really urge you to go on and to use the BUE app that we have available. Again, the link with the website will be shared with you. So I'm getting a notification now that we could go back to Ms. Gooding. So I'll ask her to share her presentation again. Carolyn? Good evening. Thank you, Winnell, and good evening and welcome to all. Um, I'm Carolyn Gooding, and with me as well this evening is my colleague, financial manager, Mr. Kevin Kalu. We understand that the global pandemic has resulted in financial challenging times, and we at the UE are here to assist you. So we will start with GATE. So all nationals of Trinidad and Tobago can access gate funding to cover tuition fees only. To do so, you will be first required to get a gate ID by visiting any TT Connect office with your ID card and birth certificate. Once you have your gate ID, you would then be able to log onto the eGate website and apply for funding. You would also be required to apply for GATE each semester that you are registered at the university. Undergraduate students, so this is the, let me just point out to you, this is the eGATE website and the contact information for the GATE office. Undergraduate students can qualify for up to 100% GATE funding. The funding percentage is known as the means test rate, which is determined by the gate office based on the supporting documentation, which you would have upload, uploaded with your eGate application. So with effect from August, 2020, the means test funding policy was amended as follows. For all applications for gate funding also include a mandatory means test. Failure to complete the means test disqualifies your application from being considered for gate funding. So these are the bans for the funding of gates. Where the household income is below $10,000 per month, you'll be eligible for 100% gate funding. Where the household income is above 10,000, but less than 30,000 per month, you will be eligible for 75% gate funding. Where the household income is above 30,000, but less than 75,000 per month, you would be eligible for 50% gate funding. And where the household income is above 75,000, 
you unfortunately will be ineligible for gate funding. So please note also that with effect from August 2020, funding under the gate program is provided for no more than one program up to the undergraduate level. Funding for postgraduate programs were also discontinued with effect from August 2020. Additionally, students who qualify for GATE can also access help loans from the GATE office to cover the portion of the tuition fees which are not covered by GATE. So nationals of Trinidad and Tobago can therefore finance all of their tuition fees through GATE funding and help loans. Let's move now to the student payment plan, which is another financing option. So most students can access this plan to pay both their tuition and hall fees. And this is open for any national of Trinidad and Tobago pursuing either the undergraduate or postgraduate programs, any national of another contributing territory apart from Trinidad and Tobago, who is not on scholarship from their respective government and tuition fees payable by the student is at least $2,600. So these plans, they run every semester and comprise two to three monthly payments. So once you qualify for the student payment plan, you simply make your payments by the stipulated deadline dates, as we've indicated here. So your first installment is due on the various dates for semester one, semester two, and semester three. There are a number of options for paying your fees. You can do so at any branch of Republic Bank using the UE Bank Deposit Slip, online through the UE My Secure Area Portal using a valid credit card, via bank transfer using internet banking. We're asking you to please keep your receipt safe and accessible as this is your evidence for payment of your fees and you would need to, to use it subsequently. And for foreign students, you can also pay via wire transfer. So you can view or download the appropriate fee booklet, which can be, um, which can be found on the site. And these are the links. And one other, one other point, the tuition fees and holds of resident fees are payable at the beginning of each semester or by the stipulated installment dates. Compulsory fees are payable in full at the beginning of the academic year. So that's in summary, the financing options available for financing your degree. And we at the Bursary Student Account section are here to assist you. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for your time and attention. And I now hand you over to our host, Winnell. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, I'm asking our colleagues in the chat to post the fee booklets as well. If you can put the links in the chat for persons to access. Now we, we have reached a point in the program where we are going to be sharing our questions and, and getting the answers for them. So for persons who have not placed their questions in the chat, I ask you to do so now and we will be starting the Q&A segment. So I ask the panelists to get prepared, get ready to turn on your mics and your cameras to answer the questions as, uh, as they come to us. I will, I will suggest persons and I suppose others can help or, or add to the um, conversation as, as needs be. So we start off with as admissions. I think this was our very first question. Uh, and the question is about awaiting results. If we are awaiting results, will we be still getting in? Simone, I, I hope you can start off the ball rolling with that answer. Sure, Renel. So if we, if we are waiting Cape Unit 2 results, yes, you will be, your application will be considered and the decision made because it is based on the decision made by the university that Cape Unit 2 was 
requirement has been waived. So yes, if it's KP Unit 2 that you are waiting results, you can receive a decision. And I know you would have gone through a step-by-step -step process earlier in your presentation, but for the purpose of those jumping on the session later, we do have quite a few questions about the application process. So uh, can you reiterate, can you talk about the steps again for our viewers? So, so step one, submit an online application form via the online application portal. As I said, no requirement, no need to come onto the campus to submit um, the application. The application is available, the online application is available via a website. Should I share it with you now? Sure. Yeah, so the submit your application online via the online application portal and the link is here. Step two, submit your documents. You're required to put in documents using the e-courier facility. Step three, keep tracking your application where you'll be provided with information regarding the application if documents are outstanding and when a decision is made. And step four, you will be notified via email that of your acceptance. Thank you very much, Simone. I, I don't think you should uh, move that those slides too much because I'm sure that I'd ask you to reiterate a little later down in the program because we do have quite a few questions as, as people jump on. I now turn to the campus registrar, Dr. Dawn Marie Fugil. She is the chair of our COVID response team on the campus, which is a subset of the incident management team on the campus. And we have quite a few questions about uh, the the state of uh, of our operations come September 2021, and uh, if it will be face to face, if it will be hybrid. So, Dr. Gill, I wonder if you could share with us and share with our viewers about the campus response to COVID-19 and and what uh, the operations would look like uh, come September. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Gregorio, and welcome all. And please excuse me um, for not turning on my camera. I've been experiencing some bandwidth issues. Um, and so in order to preserve quality, I will um, use the microphone only. Um, what has been happening since, since, the, since we've went to, uh, since we moved to an online environment last year, March, we have been conducting all of our classes online um, using our um, enterprise learning system. We have been, um, um, we did make some exceptions with respect to some face-to-face -face interactions for those programs that had labs or um, required some sort of field work. By and large, right now the campus, and you would have seen what has been happening recently um, with respect to some of the restrictions that have, have been put in place once again, we anticipate that September would be very, very much of, very much the same. We, we anticipate that we will be by and large operating in an online environment um, with some, um, some again, face-to-face -face interaction via for the labs on fieldwork, et cetera. Um, we are hoping, um, and again, this, this all depends on what is happening nationally and what is happening, what our government's um, positions, our government's positions are, um, that would also determine how we, um, if we will, if we will do any kind of pivoting to a face-to-face um, environment. But currently we are planning um, for a, a by and large for an online interaction. The campus is very focused and very um, committed to maintaining and observing all the COVID-19 protocols, both with how we handle our, 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 how we deal with our staff and our students who are very important to us. 
And so you'd find that a lot of our services have been um, have moved online, even in terms of how we support the student, as you would have heard, with um, admissions, applications, um, applying for student aid, et cetera. Um, um, Mrs. Gregory, I don't know if there was anything else you wanted me to touch on with respect to COVID-19 and, and campus operations. Yes, there is a follow-on question that we got in the chat. Uh -huh. And it has to do with uh, if classes are face-to-face, -face, will a vaccine be mandatory? So if a student opts not to be vaccinated, will there be an option to have classes online? And I suppose this question is assuming that we go back to a face-to-face -face modality in September. So again, if uh, uh, vaccination will be mandatory if we are in a face-to-face -face mode. Well, I mean, there's so many layers to that question. And, and right now, there isn't a, a national protocol in terms of, of, of vaccinations and what, what is required and what is not required. As it is right now, we will be guided by whatever national guidelines that we are given. Um, so far, we have not discussed or um, um, come to any meeting of the minds with respect to um, vaccination or vaccination policy. Um, it is still something that is being rolled out to the country. And so at this point in time, I can't comment on that. Thank, thank you, Registrar. And again, I call on my admissions colleague, Simone Roberts. And I, I'll ask you a few questions so that you can give us the answers together. What are about persons waiting on uh, you, persons awaiting unit one certificate still? Does this mean they will not be considered? Also, if you are waiting on CSEC results, are you still eligible to apply? And can I apply from now, even though I will be doing unit two? So related questions there. Over to you, Simone. Thank you again, Ronel. So if your SCAPE Unit 1 certificate is outstanding, yes, you would be considered, but when you're tracking your documents, you would see documents pending and you would be required to submit your, your CAPE Unit 1 certificate, the certified CAPE Unit 1 certificates, but it does not mean that the application will not be considered. If you're waiting on CSEC results, um, if you're waiting on CSEC results, it depends on the program that you're applying for, because if it's a certificate program that CSEC is the CSEC subjects are the requirement, then we can't make a decision on the application until we receive the results. Yes. Um, the third question is, can I apply from now, even though I'll be now, I'm still doing unit two at this point? Sure. <laughs> because I... <laughs> Waiver is in place and the decision is based on unit one results and registration for unit two. Thank you. I want to turn it over to our deputy dean in the Faculty of Medical Sciences now, Prof. Ezen Walker. And uh, Prof, are you with us this, this evening? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so we are having a, a couple of questions about the Faculty of Medical Sciences, their particulars, the particulars of uh, deadline dates, et cetera. So are you able to give our viewers some details? In terms of gates? In terms of the application process and how it differs from uh, the other faculties. I'm trying to put on my video, but it's not allowing that I was. Um, the, what happens in Faculty of Medical Sciences when you apply and you have your unit one, um, we'll be waiting for unit two. And you know, in Faculty of Medical Sciences, there are about six um professional group optometry uh, pharmacy dentistry veterinary medicine nursing and um medicine last year we tried to some of the disciplines that is some of the program that tried to waive uh cap two for the students that um, request was made during admission 
And we required uh, BUS to approve that. We did it as one time event last time. And if any of the programs cannot get the required number of students this time, they will still be considered. But that is uh, based on the number of applicants and the number of offers we have. Some of the uh, programs are oversubscribed with uh, candidates that have both CAPE Unit 1 and CAPE Unit 2. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Any other one? Yes, we have, um, will applications be accepted to MedSci with year one CAPE for the coming academic year while awaiting the Unit 2 results? Yes, we did that for uh, some uh, programs like vet uh, school did that, pharmacy and some other programs. Um, I think optometry uh, on the consideration that the person registered for CAPE Unit 2. But if it is for MBBS, um, that might be difficult because we are usually oversubscribed with people that are already qualified. Even at times we have um, uh, people that have already been given admission. So, but if we are in short of uh, students, that might be considered, but we will need approval and agreement with other campuses on using that criteria on admission. You know, our MBBS program, we do everything in the same way with Barbados and Mona colleagues. Okay. And turning your attention now to the pre-science program, could you talk in general about the pre-science program and uh, the, the, the transition to, to medical school thereafter? Yeah, we have, um, we admit students from uh, N1 program and we have the one we call pre-health program uh, who are, uh, essentially already admitted into the Faculty of Medical Sciences. But if it is uh, pre-science, which is the program run by Faculty of Science and Technology, we admit students um, into Faculty of Medical Sciences, that's N1, and the requirement we take it at the level of Cape 2. And they have comparative assessment um, across the board so people who did who have the prerequisite um, requirement in terms of CSEC and they did N1, we consider them the way we consider the CAPE 2 candidate. And if it is those who entered through pre-health, we would have remedied them to the level of getting an average of uh, GPA of 3.0, and they will be admitted into the faculty for the different programs of dentistry, veterinary medicine, or medicine. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you for those um, answers. All right, thank you. And uh, now ask Christy Smith to join us. Uh, we have uh, two sets of questions. Certainly. Uh, so, uh, first question, do I apply for a scholarship first or the program or in parallel together? That's the first one. And then there's a question surrounding the decision process, how long it takes and, and what will be the process for response? Okay, thank you for the questions. And um, just to say that our scholarships and bursaries are all privately sponsored awards, and that would lay some context for the second question um, that, that uh, has been asked. So these are all from private donors, and these scholarships are non-tuition based, which means that students can choose to use the funds to do, you know, basically whatever they need to do. They can pay their tuition, but it's not mandatory that they use it to pay their tuition. So they can use it for a range of other, um, other financial uh, situations that they may be facing. Now, that being said, to, to direct more to the uh, question asked, the first question, students, of course, are asked first to apply to the University of the West Indies. And of course, Ms. Roberts would have gone through the application process. It is only after you apply, you've, you've of course received your offer letter, you go online, you, you apply and you, you register, 
that you can then engage in the application for scholarships and bursaries. So just to reiterate, our application period runs from the 1st to the 30th of September. And so that, that gives you adequate time. Um, you would have already received your package, most of you, and applied, uh, I'm sorry, received your package and registered, we hope by at least mid-September. So that period is for applications. Uh, the second part of the, the question refers to the time frame. Uh, like I said before, these are privately donated awards, and so our sponsors play a major role in the decision making process. When a student applies during the application period in September, we have a number of processes that uh, we, we take the, the applications through, of course, to determine uh, the best fit for the criteria set by the university and the donors. And sometimes that takes a bit, a, a little while, um, but our awards meeting where we do the actual selection usually takes place in October and students are usually informed by the end of November. Of course, we, we work with our donors, we work with campus stakeholders um, in the selection meeting. To, to select the most eligible candidate. And then we engage in a number of processes with our donors to sanction the nomination. So I would say uh, you apply in September, our meeting takes place in October and you are awarded in November. Last year, of course, COVID-19 sort of set us back, but we are on track for this year. And so we hope to receive your applications um, by the 30th of September. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive overview. And uh, I ask now our Deputy Dean of Outreach for the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Mr. Jessel Murray, to get ready. I have a question about enrollment in the Bachelor of Education program. And the question surrounds the requirements for same. And um, the question says, I'm a final year student awaiting one course, but I am required to enroll as I am an assistant teacher primary in a school already. Mr. Murray, are you able to answer that? With, are you with us? Yes, I'm seeing you. Yeah, yeah, well, based on the, of course, of the handbook requirements, um, that there are three levels of which, of which um, the people can enter. If you are a practicing teacher and you have a teacher's college diploma, you will then get some level of, uh, um, of exemption, which allows you to enter. If you're an untrained teacher in the, in the primary school, and you have um, five C second two K, then you are eligible to enter and and to, com to complete the degree of ninety three credits, and then if neither of those two cases um, apply to you, then then you can also be um, be subject to an interview, um, can go through the process of an interview, and uh, your eventual acceptance will be based on your seniority, your portfolio of work and your, your general admissions of up to as to what you bring to quote unquote to the table as a professional educator. So those are the three particular paths that you can get through. Teacher's diploma, um, CSEC plus um, CAPE slash A levels, or by an, by an interview um, through um, um, what you bring to the table, plus of course your professional accomplishments. I hope that will be helpful in answering the question. Thank you for that. And if there's a follow on chat to message us and we shall ask Mr. Murray again. Thank you for that, Mr. Murray. And uh, we now turn to an engineering focus question. I'm asking Dr. Sanjay Bahadur Singh to come on camera with us to join us. And the question reads, I'm currently in Cape and I want to pursue engineering, but I am not studying pure math. However, I'm studying physics and chemistry together with my other three subjects. Will I still stand a chance of acceptance according to my grades, even though I do not have the math? I know, thanks for that. You need mathematics. So my suggestion is that um, that candidate looks at opportunities to improve their math background and uh, take the opportunity for them to look at the pre-engineering program, which can help them address the deficiencies in that particular area because that's what that program is geared for to ensure that they meet the matriculation requirements. I hope that helps. Thank you for that. And, and I want to use this opportunity to state that in the coming weeks, we will have faculty specific open days 
where you can come on and speak to the faculty representatives, the dean, the deputy deans, and it will be specifically about the faculty of engineering. So I'm urging the viewers to, to really look out for the list of open days. I'm sure it's in the chat right now, and you can make a note, mark your calendar for, for that one-on-one -on -one session specifically focused on engineering. I am now asking my colleague Nigel Bradshaw to join us. I have two questions I want you to address. One that we had earlier in the chat, which asked about the prospect meeting. I think it will be it will be great if you can share a lot more about the process. I know uh, Ms. Robert shared it earlier, but if you could share or reiterate the process for a prospect meeting, and and perhaps while you're at it, a parent meeting, and then we have a question relating to to open campus which is one of our sister campuses. And the question relates to applying for short courses at the open campus. And if there's a sim similar application um, requirement or are they different? So if you can address those two particular questions. Okay, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Nigel Bradshaw here, undergraduate student recruitment officer at the University of the West Indies, St. Edison campus. Um, we have had um, for the last two years, we've been offering for persons that are very much willing to get an intimate experience in terms of interactions associated with admissions, applications, understanding the undergraduate student experience, um, the, que the question and answer session that you normally would not have the opportunity to get via email or a random telephone call we created the opportunity for parents along with prospective students and prospective students of any age to interact with us via what we call a parent and prospect meeting as the undergraduate student recruitment officer i am um, i work uh, very closely with a number of students undergraduate and postgraduate students of the university of west Indies, called admission student advocates these students, they work with me in the promotion of our recruitment strategy across Trinidad and Tobago, and sometimes even beyond Trinidad and Tobago. We um, do visitor services, which include a campus store program, which has come to an halt because of the fact that the pandemic has shut the campus down. We're hoping to move that into a virtual format soon. But we continue with the parent and prospect meeting. If you send me an email via my email address, which will be put into the chat in a little while, you can reach me and request the parent and prospect meeting. We collaborate to be able to set aside a time and a date for the opportunity to be able to interact. And I would be present for that meeting. We, use, we utilize the Google Meet virtual platform to do so which allows us to be able to speak uh, unencumbered for quite some time if, if need be, but normally it really takes just about one hour um, to be able to share all the information that persons would like in that, um, that type of a private session. Um, the students are with me to be able to share information about their programs, what their student experiences like both pre-pandemic and now during the pandemic, what they hope to be able to achieve otherwise, and also to what to be able to genuinely understand about UW experience, how to prepare for it, what are some of the, the, um, the major highs that you will have, how to be able to deal with some of the challenges that you can expect for anyone transitioning from any other type of um, academic stage in their life to now undergraduate um, study, et cetera. So, and it's totally free we allow persons to be able to interact with, interact with us for no cost. So that's it for the parent and prospect meeting. For the um, information about the open campus, now we normally would allow our colleagues at the open campus to, to share their information. Um, they are now totally online. They have no physical representatives at any of the centers that can be found at St. Augustine, Chaguanas, San Fernando, or Tobago. They are e most easily found via the um, Facebook page, which goes by UWIOCTT. If you do a search on, their fa on Facebook, UWIOCTT, all one word, and you'll be able to find them there. They are very responsive to the questions that are asked. 
I can elaborate now to let you know that the application process requires completing a JOT form, an online JOT form indicating your basic information, name, surname, um, email address. Um, then there's no major requirement to enter um, specific academic qualifications. Many of the programs are of a craft type level, so they, they don't ask um, those, those types of questions. Um, they normally would ask if, you know, you have to indicate which programs you're interested in. And thereafter, they get in contact with you via the contact information you left, which would be an, your email or your telephone um, number. And that's it for the Open Campus and their short course program. Uh, any other questions we immediately would know? Sure, of course, while you're there. I, I would like you to clarify for our prospects the birth paper. I know we get this question quite often about mm -hmm. the new birth paper as a requirement. And the second question is about being locked out of the account when we have an applicant um, in, the, in the process. What can they do? So if you can address those two. Okay, dealing with the, um, the first one with respect to the birth paper. The, Persons that have not yet updated their birth paper, a national uh, birth certificate, Trinidad and Tobago birth certificate, we normally would allow persons to upload that document. The, that document also too needs to be certified, meaning that it needs to be dated, stamped, and signed by any one of these persons, principal of this, the institution you're attending, secondary school or educational institution, or the vice principal. Um, a commissioner of affidavits, a justice of the peace, or a notary public. Any one of those persons can certify a copy of that document before it is uploaded and sent to admissions using the new e courier process to be able to ensure that we receive it. It is preferred to have the polymer version, but with the pandemic creating new challenges for accessing even the, um, the public services, we would, we would allow generally for persons to provide for us what they do have and to certify, once they have gotten the document certified by those persons that we listed. Once again, principal or vice principal of the institution that you're currently attending, if secondary school or other, um, or a notary public or a commissioner of affidavits or a justice of the peace. Um, many students are very busy now checking the applicants. They are very busy now checking or tracking their applications on a daily basis. I know social media tends to play a part in that. You know, when it is you see your colleagues indicating that they've received some type of feedback from the UWI St. Augustine with respect to applications, people become a little bit frenzied and wanting to get information about them um, about what their prospects are as well. So you will have persons sometimes logging in quite frequently at the application portal. And what this sometimes does is it creates an issue with the portal, create, um, creating a safety or security arrangement that would block persons that are continuously logging in. If, um, sometimes persons in their haste to log in, they enter incorrect credentials as well. If either happens and you're locked out, we have now updated the application system to allow you to be able to reset your login credentials by just going to the landing page once again and seeking out in the specific area on the landing page where you see the question forgot password. Once you click on forgot password, you will be once again allowed to re-enter a username and ID, uh, um, sorry, a username and it's a ID number, right? So act to be able to once again access your application portal and track your application. Thank you very much. I'm sure I'll be calling on you again at, at some point in the program, but thank you very much for now. Not a problem. Prof. Ezen Walker, I am calling on you again for FMS, the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and someone joining us recently is asking for you to reiterate the information you shared about the N1 program 
and getting into to the faculty as well as another question a part, another question from another prospect about the best time to apply to get in to fms what is the best time um starting with the last one uh, the there's no best time but the thing is to hit the deadline and when students say uh, fms i need to repeat that there are uh, six um, professional discipline in that uh, faculty and they have to be specific whether they want to do mbbs dds dvm pharmacy nursing or optometry but i want to presume that uh, many people, when they say medical science, is, is most likely that they mean to do MBBS. So students who want to come in through N1, which is pre-science, um, we require that they would have done biology and chemistry and any other science base. That could be physics, mathematics, or natural science. I've seen some people read even economics any of the sciences, our um, criteria said any other science, but biology and chemistry must be passed. That is for everyone. And their consideration are also based on their performances because people who are coming in using KIP uh, one, two, in most cases, students who are coming in for uh, medical school using KIP, they are usually scholars of one, 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 and two. Um, because uh, we, if, if I tell you the, the total point is about 30, and in most cases, nationals of the country, we have so many people coming with 30 over 30 points uh, for MBBS, for dentistries, uh, in many occasions, oversubscribed. Um, then uh, vets is there, pharmacy orders that take that. And so coming to the time to apply, you apply and make sure you submit uh, the appropriate document, just like the assistant registry admissions mentioned. When what happens is we, um, we usually make provisions for starting time for our students. In fact, I'm reviewing the, uh, the timetable for 2021, 2022. And the university starts teaching around first week in September. Like I know our year twos, we start around 6th of uh, September, but we usually make provision for our students because at times we are delay in uh, concluding for all the admissions. So uh, we usually start year one students in faculty of medical sciences second week instead of the first week that you see in the university timetable. So if you apply and submit your documents early enough, uh, you will be considered. I think the deadline is the deadline for you to uh, submit your applications. And then we continue doing meeting even up to end of August. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. And Thank uh, you. I'll use this opportunity again to remind our viewers we will be having faculty specific open days so those interested in the details can get more when we have the, the specific um, open days that you will see in the chat yes and some of the individuals the people should note that in faculty of medical sciences school of nursing we uh, admit students with csec if you go to the website for um, Jamaica, uh, they use uh, uh, air level for admission into School of Nursing. But here in St. Augustine, we admit with CSEC. That is the only professional program that uh, admits students uh, using CSEC. Others are keep the, the uh, degree program uh, certification. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Principal, I now invite you to the to the virtual podium. I have two questions for you. Principal, are you with us at this time? Very much. Okay. Uh, the two questions is UE still partnering with local entities in the fight against COVID-19? 
And the second is if the campus has a plan to offer programs specifically on innovation and entrepreneurship. Okay, thanks for that question. Um, the answer to both of them is yes, and I'll just elaborate a bit. Um, the COVID-19 activity has not stopped. It has been slowed down because um, uh, unfortunately in, in um, creating the, the different PPE, um, looking at the different machines and so on, ventilators and the like, we do rely on uh, acquiring um, medical components from abroad. That flow internationally has slowed down since um, COVID-19, not so much because of, um, well, I'm gonna say not so, not, not so much because of um, the, uh, um, the lack of availability as in the supply on the supply side, but the demand side has increased tremendously. And being a third world nation, you find that um, a lot of these components are directed, of course, to the first world nations that, that are actually feverishly trying to, to, um, to build their inventory of PPE and support equipment. But we have not stopped. We have worked with Label House in, um, in very early in the game in producing masks, um, uh, face shields, I'm sorry. And those face shields are in fact available. They were, the, they were also the first out of the block in providing a local variant um, of, of, of that product. Um, and in fact, we have a license agreement with them. We are still working on the, um, the, the ventilator. It is almost done um, from what I'm told. It's still um, far too long a time, but that work is still ongoing. With respect to innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, that is in fact, that whole thrust is a, a major one for the campus. In fact, the way, the way we see that I indicated in my talk is that, is that um, we need as a university that, support, that is supporting its region, help it to develop its economic space. The economics of the Caribbean has, has really suffered a blow over the last um, couple of decades actually, depending on which island you're, you're on. Um, and of course, this ties into the whole issue of, of diversification. Um, so we really do see you as the leaders of industry, um, uh, that us industry being a, that, that swarm I mentioned of small and medium um, uh, enterprises. In gearing for this, we have in fact developed an innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem that starts in the faculty where primarily the, the, um, the, the ideas are generated. Um, concepts uh, uh, given birth and so on. And whereas previously it was difficult to move those ideas into commercial um, implementation, if it is a commercial target, sometimes the target is not commercial, maybe social, maybe ecological. Um, we plan to treat with those um, in, in new course. Um, th there was nothing available. And so what we have done is that we have created the mechanism to move them forward through an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship unit that is based on the faculty of social sciences that provides exactly the, the type of mentorship that the um, or mentoring that the uh, that that the, the person asking the question um, uh, um, uh, referenced, um, and so the the, the people there um, uh, in, the, in the entrepreneurship unit, again, it sits in the faculty of social sciences, um, provides a range of of courses and programs. Um, to help students and staff develop their project ideas going forward. Um, faculties across the campus have included entrepreneurship um, courses within their offerings. Um, uh, but, but the main um, innovation and entrepreneurship activity is one that actually works with students and staff on projects that they're actually developing. And that development goes all the way to pre-commercial readiness. Um, uh, uh, you get into to um, fund some funding is available. Uh, you have um, issues of, of um, intellectual property, property protection, um, creation of brands, creation of business um, uh, business plans, and so on, which the entrepreneurship unit um, assists with. And once they're ready, then we formed a company called UE Ventures. Um, it is not under UE, but it is of UE in a sense. It's a subsidiary in a sense that has a separate governance structure built for agility and speed. And um, the idea is that those, those projects would then, would then um, feed into the creation of spin-offs and startups that will be under UE Venture. UE Venture is a holding company. So it's so a long complicated answer to, 
to what seems like a, a straightforward question that requires a yes or no um, sort of response. And I just want to make the point that it's much more detailed than just um, offering courses on entrepreneurship and, and, and uh, possibly even innovation. We're actually doing it. Um, we're not just teaching it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Principal. And, and perhaps I can ask my colleagues in the chat to share UV Ventures' website. They can see more about it there. They can, they can get more in-depth information. We also have the UE Today newspapers. The archive on the website is really robust and uh, any of the topics that the principal spoke about can be searched and, and there will be articles around those topics. So Dr. Eudoxy, I'm smiling when I see your, your, your thumbnail that you love soil. I, I see the passion in, in, in that. And I have two questions for you. Uh, a, a prospect wants to know about labs, specifically how labs are going to be conducted in light of the, the COVID-19 restrictions, as well as another question about someone wanting to get into water resources slash environmental and natural resources, but they did not do science at CSEC but they have done integrated and agricultural science. Uh, so they're asking about the application process in light of the subjects that they would have done and um, your advice on this. Thank you so very much, uh, and a uh, pleasant good afternoon, good, good evening uh, to our prospects. Uh, pertaining to the first question, I think other members of our panel spoke to how the uh, campus uh, and uh, St. Augustine campus in particular would have addressed the uh, ongoing uh, activities pertaining to uh, students on campus and how we would have uh, moved ahead with uh, administering these practical components of our labs. Uh, fortunately, uh, as mentioned I think by our registrar, uh, we were able to uh, have some amount of activity uh, that was uh, particularly are required as part of the core components of some of our programs. Uh, but we have as well transitioned and utilized the technology to our advantage in such that we are able to do some amount of virtual labs, uh, some amount of home labs as well. And we have been able to ensure that students get an opportunity to uh, participate in some of those uh, uh, practical elements. So as the restrictions hold, uh, we still are not allowing students uh, on campus to perform uh, those labs, but we have transitioned uh, to a mode that allows for uh, complementary uh, learning of those skills uh, via a virtual modality. And as I said, sometimes we have as well engaged students in doing more home-based labs uh, to learn some of uh, the similar skills. So uh, when uh, our campus has informed us uh, that uh, such activities are once again allowed, uh, we will move to inform students of same. Uh, with regards to the second question, I want to inform our prospect that uh, integrated science uh, uh, and, uh, is a recognized uh, science and we do take it as one of the sciences. Uh, if you do not, however, have the requisite uh, science subjects that are required for, for instance, the environmental and natural resource management program, which is uh, one of the thematic areas I, I noted in question. Uh, there are other opportunities and other pathways that the faculty has created uh, for students to be able to uh, come and ensure that the career paths are met. Uh, for instance, we do have a certificate in environmental geography uh, that uh, allows for matriculation from CXC into that program. It's a one year, uh, full-time program and students immediately from uh, completing that program are then eligible to enter into uh, our environmental uh, based programs within the faculty. Um, so they are and we do have uh, certificate programs across our three departments that allows for students from C, uh, CSEC level to enter into our faculty and then do a one year that allows for matriculation into our BSc. Uh, however, uh, we also have a, a particular clause similar to, I think, our colleagues from Humanities that indicates uh, if you do have um, the lower level matriculation, 
and you do have key subjects and you have relevant experience and, and are categorized as an uh, adult student, uh, we can look at your portfolio and have an interview and then determine whether or not you meet the criteria uh, to be accepted into that program. Uh, so I would invite the student uh, to probably reach out for that prospective student uh, to reach out uh, to the faculty uh, where we can uh, probably provide some more personalized um, advice. Thanks very much. Thank you. And again, I, I will share that we do have the, the faculty specific open days coming up. So I invite persons to tune in for, for that date. And we are nearing the top of the hour. So I, I will probably go really quickly. I asked my colleague from the Faculty of Law to stand by. We have a, we have a couple of questions on the Faculty of Law and the, the process for application for the LLB. Dr. Ku, are you with us and are able to share? Hi, evening everyone. Yes, just trying to turn on my video. Yep, um, yeah, questions. Great. So, so one of the questions we got is about the, LA, the process for application. Is it different from any of the other faculties? How does one apply into the LLB? And, and perhaps you could take the opportunity generally to give an overview of, of the faculty. Yep, okay, great. Um, thanks for that question. Yeah, so there's no special application process. You fill in the regular application. I should note, that preference is given to students who choose law as their first subject. Um, so if you choose law as your second, third, fourth, um, we can't guarantee that you will get entry through that because we do place emphasis on those who have chosen us first. Um, having said that, and the application process being the same, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the direct entrant um, aspect. If you have a degree from before, I an undergraduate degree and or undergraduate and postgraduate degree, and you have a first class honors in that undergraduate degree, you will be eligible for the direct entry. There's no special application process for this direct entry um, program. When it gets to the entrance committee level, we will recommend to students whether they are eligible for the direct entry and then they can make that decision. If you do get uh, the direct entry status, you can do the LLB program, which is typically a three-year program. It's 93 credits. Uh, you can do that uh, in the space of two years instead of three years. So it is an accelerated program. It is quite difficult. So it is uh, important to consider it properly, but for those students who've already had a degree and have been in higher education for a while, it is an option to consider. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Generally speaking about the Faculty of Law, um, I welcome everyone to uh, apply. Law and the study of law is a very interesting topic. Um, I have three law degrees, so I, I love the law and it really does change your life. So if you are ready for a wild ride, um, law, law may be the area for you. Thank you, thank you for that sharing. You have me, um, you have me laughing, a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing the prospects applying now with, with excitement. Uh, okay, so we have a few, a few uh, speakers still for a few minutes, but before that I want to ask our Faculty of Social Sciences representative to answer the question. It, it's a general question. It, it's really quite wide and it's about uh, business programs that we have here on the campus, what business programs we have, and I know there's a wide range, so you may want to give a, a, an overview as well as route persons to where they can get more information. Uh, do we have uh, a representative from the Faculty of Social Sciences? I believe we had Dr. Anri Mohammed with us. Hi, good afternoon. Are you hearing me? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the question and um, welcome to any prospective students to our faculty. We belong to the Faculty of Social Sciences. Your interest in business means that you are looking to do a bachelor's degree in management studies, maybe in economics. Also, you have a BSc in accounting. All our BSc programs, they are three-year programs, while doing a BSc in business, you can also at the same time also do a minor that will give you a subspecialty 
So you can find all of our information on our faculty website. You just look for the faculty booklet for undergraduate students and it will take you through a list of what we have available as far as business, uh, as far as being part of a business type program. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Manal. Thanks for that sharing. And again, I'll ask my colleagues to share more links in the chat so that they can give more information. And uh, as we wrap up the evening session, I want our assistant registrar for admissions, Mr. Moon Roberts, to, to jump on again, uh, as we have several requests to reiterate the application process and a specific focus is being asked for when persons can hear, when will they hear about their acceptance. This was asked quite a few times, I understand, in the chat, when will persons hear back from the campus? Simone? Thank you, now. So before I go over the application process, I just want to make two points because I've heard the questions come up um, throughout the session this evening. And I just want to confirm that the closing date for submission of applications is the 31st of July, and this applies to all programs, yes, to all undergraduate programs. So it doesn't matter if you're applying to the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Law, Social Sciences, the closing date is the 31st of July, 2021. The same application process applies for all programs as well. So you submit an on online application, you, sub you submit your supporting documents, you track your application, you receive a, um, a notice of acceptance. The difference may be, among programs, may be the documents that are required to be submitted. So for example, applicants to the MBBS, DVM, DDS programs are required to submit a supplemental sheet, which they need to, which they, in which they include activity, co-curricular activities that they would have completed over the years. So the documents may be different for the programs, but the actual process is the same for all programs for which you wish to apply. Um, notification of, of, of acceptance. So the process that I outlined is the applicant's involvement in the process. What is required of the applicant? But following the submission of the application, following the submission of the documents, the admission section now has its part and the faculty has its part to play and the time, timing of a decision can't be very exact or precise because it depends on when you submit your application, when your documents have been submitted, and then these need to be processed by the respective faculty entrance committees. So it will be difficult to give a specific time period um, by which applicants will receive, um, will receive decisions. But it depends your submission of your, your application. And once all your documents are submitted, certified, the decision can be taken after that. Anything else, Manel? Anything I forgot? I think that's it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Gooding, Carolyn Gooding, if we can um, have you talk about GATE, just, just a synopsis of the GATE process. Are you with us still? Yes, I am. I'll, I'll ask my colleague, Mr. Kevin Kalu, to take us through that question. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Mrs. Gooding. Um, I saw the question in the chat. Sorry, good evening, uh, prospective students and colleagues. I saw the question in the chat about um, GATE funded programs. And I'm happy to say that the majority of our UWI programs are GATE approved and GATE funded, with the exception of a handful, very few. Um, what I would suggest is uh, prospective students could visit the GATE website and attempt an application and you could, they would see a drop down list of all the uh, GATE approved programs. Uh, whilst there, they could also 
uh, find a lot of useful information about the gate application process. In fact, there's a, a nice uh, six minute video that would walk you through the entire process. Very, very useful video. So I would urge prospective students to visit with that website and uh, they can find a lot of useful information about the gate application process there. I'm sure we can share that link to Winnell um, in the chat uh, to the gate website. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. We will ask our colleagues to share that. And viewers, prospects, parents, well wishers, we bring this evening's program to a close and I ask you to look in the chat, you'll see a link for a survey. We really ask you to give us feedback on this evening's session. If there were any questions that remain unanswered, we didn't get the time to answer them, I ask you to email our recruitment officer, Nigel Bradshaw, his link will be his email address sorry will be in the chat as well i ask you to email him and you will get a response as well as the recording the recording from this evening session will be be saved on facebook and we ask you to even share that with persons that you may know of who are considering a degree with us at the university of the west indies so we ask you to share the recording and from all of us, from all of us on the panel, from all of us at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, we really thank you for joining us this evening and we look forward to welcoming you on our campus in September 2021. Have a good night. <laughs>